first day of November. It is hard to believe that already it's November. My name is Judy Peterson and I serve as the Public Information Officer for the Fairfax County Park Authority. Welcome to our second virtual community meeting on PROSA, the Parks, Recreation, Open Space and Access Strategy, which we're going to learn a whole lot more about tonight. This is a staff-led virtual public meeting and although we may have elected or appointed officials in attendance, I want to reiterate that this is considered a community meeting and any elected or appointed officials will not be voting at this meeting on any part of this project. They will simply be listening to your input and perhaps even sharing their thoughts um, as we discuss the topics tonight. And I thank you very much for making time in your busy lives for, uh, for joining us. We know how important personal time can be. Now this meeting is being conducted electronically through dedicated video and audio conferencing and the public can access this meeting via the Park Authority website. And uh, the public can also participate by phone. I know we actually have some folks on phone by calling 888-270-9936 and entering the access code 411-406, okay? I, I do wanna tell folks that uh, tonight is being recorded. Um, that's, that's good news because there are some folks who perhaps wanted to be here this evening and couldn't join us. And we'll be posting this on our website in the next few days. So um, there'll be more access than even the folks who are here tonight. And we're expecting a couple of dozen, which is uh, very, uh, we're very pleased with that. So tonight we have a, a robust agenda. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, our plan is to, to make this workshop really worth your time and ours together. You're gonna hear an introduction that outlines the project and we'll explore best practices regarding access to parks and try and figure out what it is that you like to do when you visit parks. We'll also be holding a polling session followed by a workshop in which you tell us what you like to do and see and experience in your park system. We're also gonna answer questions and listen to your comments. And as we conclude, we're gonna tell you what it is that's coming next. I would ask, of course, as uh, we get into our discussion periods, that people uh, sort of stay on topic, if you will, um, and that we also try and be respectful of um, our time limits and try to, uh, to keep comments uh, relatively brief so that everybody has an opportunity to speak. So how does all this work? Well, for the duration of this meeting, we're gonna be accepting comments and questions in the Zoom chat box. And you can put your comments in the chat and we'll share them with others. Um, and then we'll do our best to respond. You can also raise your hand virtually and, and I will recognize you. And of course, as I mentioned, you can also call in as others have done. Calling again is a little bit complex, but doable. And if you wanna dial in and speak to us over the phone, again, that's 888-270-9936 with the entering of the code 411406. Once you dial in, it gets even more complicated. Um, we're going to place you in a waiting room, and then once the host lets you in, uh, we'll ask you to speak your name. And um, if you want to speak, you're going to press uh, star six, and that will unmute or mute, uh, depending on the situation. So, and then when you're all set and ready to speak to us, we'll ask you to uh, step away from your computer, uh, because there's a bit of a delay, and sometimes um, we'll hear ourselves twice through your phone. Uh, I promise to go over this again as needed because I do know that it can be a little bit challenging. So again, I'm reminding you that this uh, meeting is going to be recorded and then posted on the project website. And um, you can also offer further comment on the website. And uh, I think uh, at this point, what I'd like to do is to, uh, we're gonna introduce our speakers in just a few moments, but I also wanna mention a couple of folks in attendance who will not be speaking but I think they're worthy of mentioning. Uh, Sam Hudson is the manager of the planning branch. Sam, welcome. Robert Boyd is a senior park planner. Greg uh, or Grace uh, Daigle is an analyst from Kimley Horn and Associates, and she's joined us as well. So at this time, I'm going to be quiet, and I'm going to ask Park Authority Deputy Director Amy Vosper to offer some welcoming remarks. Amy? Thank you, Judy. 
Good evening and welcome to our PROSA workshop. Um, I'm Amy Vosper, one of the deputy directors with the Park Authority overseeing uh, planning and development. And I just wanted to say a warm welcome. And also thank you for taking the time. This is a very important project for us, for the Park Authority, and we need your input. And I greatly appreciate your presence here tonight. I wanted to also um, introduce, and I know I'm taking a little of Judy's thunder, but we have our new division director for planning and development, Brendan, with us tonight as well. Thanks again for coming. Uh, that's right. You stole a little of my thunder, but that's okay. We can uh, we can say nice things about Brendan twice. Uh, he is the director of the Park Planning and Development Division. He is uh, new to the job, but long tenured and well experienced as a park planner. Uh, Brendan, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you, Judy. Thank you, Amy. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming tonight. This is uh, it's a great turnout, and as Amy mentioned, this is really important to us to get uh, to get input in as we uh, go through this important work. Um, and then PROSA lays the groundwork for the Park Authority to improve access to parks and provide an equitable park system for all in our community. That's very critical. It's uh, this plan is key to our setting our long term direction for the entire park system. Uh, everything from maintenance to acquisition. Uh, the outcomes of uh, PROSA will inform our capital improvement program. Again, uh, maintenance, capital uh, capital spending and acquisition decisions. So again, this is a very important process to grow our, grow our agency wisely, uh, grow our offerings wisely. Uh, PROSA also aligns the Park Authority capital planning priorities with major county initiatives such as a strategic plan, Active Fairfax and One Fairfax, uh, incredibly important initiatives by Fairfax County uh, to, to, to align for the future. And, and PROSA really helps the Park Authority align with the vision for Fairfax County. So uh, thank you all for joining tonight. Uh, please share your perspectives. Uh, we would really appreciate that. And um, I'll pass it back to Judy. Thanks, Brendan. It's now my pleasure to ask Stephanie Cronejo, the project manager and long range planning section chief to explain PROSA and to set the stage for our work tonight. Stephanie. Good evening. Uh, foremost, the Park Authority's mission statement builds upon its history of natural and cultural resource stewardship and providing quality recreational facilities and experiences that promote diversity, inclusion and healthy lifestyles. The park system is the primary public mechanism in Fairfax County for the preservation of environmentally sensitive land and resources, areas of historic significance, and the provisions of recreational facilities and services. And to support that mission, we're developing the Parks, Recreation, Open Space, and Access Strategy, also known as PROSA. Tonight, we'll go over the main project objectives, the project schedule, and the elements of the project. We're spearheading PROSA because of the Parks Recreation System Master Plan goals and the Park, Rec Park Authority Strategic Plans, Objectives, and Policies. More specifically, the Strategic Plan outlines an action step to develop and implement an approach to county park planning and capital projects that considers resource protection, service level delivery, equity, recreation, and community needs. It also contains a strategic objective to increase walkable access by county residents to park or facility entrances or trailheads to connect people to nature and recreational experiences. The strategic objective outlines to increase the amount of residents within walkable access within a half mile or 10 minute walk countywide and a quarter mile or five minute walk in special planning areas. Building on the Parks and Recreation System Master Plan, the strategic plan and one Fairfax, the process strategy will provide a framework for equitable access to FCPA parks in the park system. PROSA is a strategy to create an equitable park system where residents can access a park within a 10 minute walk from their home. The strategy will provide a roadmap for improved park access and a balance of recreational experiences to meet the diverse needs of Fairfax County residents. To get there, we'll identify gaps in 10 minute walk access to parks. We'll take into account complete park experiences by determining the types of recreation categories or experiences like active recreation, contemplative experiences, and social gatherings, and define which facility types generally fall into these experiences. 
We'll also examine habitat connectivity, and then we'll take all data and look at it through an equity lens. That is to say, factoring in equity using demographics and socioeconomic data. And we'll dive into these elements just a bit in a few moments. Turning to the project schedule, the project is anticipated to occur over 14 months with completion in summer 2023. There are six primary project phases that generally include data gathering, analysis, public engagement, strategy development, and strategy of approval. To date, we've completed phase one of the project, which included extensive background research, data gathering on best and emerging practices, and developed park entrance GIS data. Currently, we're in phases two and three, which include public engagement, analysis, and report development. Diving into the four main objectives for the 10 minute walk analysis, our goal is to identify which households can and cannot access an FCAPA park within a 10 minute walk from their home. In fact, currently 52% of residents in Fairfax County can access an FCPA park entrance within 10 minutes from their home. We'll identify geographic priority areas to improve walk access to FCPA parks and identify opportunities to increase the 10 minute walk through existing and future parkland or trails. PROSA is a strategy to create an equitable park system where residents can access a variety of park experiences. To do so, we're looking at complete park experiences, which consist of active recreation, passive contemplative recreation, social gathering, and natural cultural recreation. For this component of PROSA, we're going to identify which areas do not have access to the primary experience categories within a 10 minute walk or a five minute drive from their home. We'll also evaluate parks based on a park score to understand the balance of these experiences at park sites. We'll also look at habitat connectivity and identify opportunities to improve habitat health at existing parks and identify whether there are opportunities to expand habitat connectivity through existing parkland or potential future parkland acquisitions. And most importantly, we'll use an equity lens to analyze and prioritize projects. We'll utilize one Fairfax as a foundation using one Fairfax's tools and data, and we'll build from the county's vulnerability index as a foundation for our analysis and findings. So the process strategy will provide a roadmap for improved park access and a balance of recreational experiences, and we'll use an equity lens to analyze and prioritize projects. Now that we've walked through the project elements, I'll pass it back to Judy. Thank you very much. Very interesting. At this point, we want to explore best practices as it relates to park access and also to park experiences. And we've been working very closely with our consultants, Kimley and Horn. Representing them this evening is Nick Kuhn. Nick? Thank you, Judith. Yeah, so I'm here to talk a little bit about best practices. And this is a, a fun part in terms of park planning. We've, we've got a lot to kind of talk about through our national experience working with park planning. Um, and what you see on the screen here, uh, I wanted to elaborate a little bit more on, this is the aspects of level of service. And this is how we measure how we provide parks and recreation in, in our communities. And so we have a, a bit of the science side to this. Uh, some of you might have heard of level of service measurements, um, particularly through transportation planning. This is one element that a lot of roadway networks are rated on a A to F scale with F being the lowest grade or lowest quality um, road network. So this, this is one way, and there's a lot of science to understand behind evaluating roadways like that. But this is where the art aspect comes into park planning because for park planning, there really are no national standards to this. And we see that as a very good thing because this allows each community to really define what level of park provision is desired. And it allows for your communities to be unique. And so you can see here, this is really a measurement not to compare communities or judge a community on the level of parks, but really it's a way for a community to express what is acceptable in terms of access uh, and provision of parks and recreation services. So let's dive into a little bit of the best practices here. And we start first by talking about park history uh, park planning history here, particularly over the last 150 to 170 years in the United States. So 
I won't give an overall long history lesson here, but really what we wanted to highlight through this is some of the research that Dr. Galen Kranz of UC Berkeley has done over the last 20 years in terms of park planning and the different eras of parks throughout the United States from the 1850s uh, through today. And in this diagram, what you'll see is two parts. The top portion is our uh, listings of goals of parks. And the bottom are functions of parks. And what you see first out of the pleasure ground era of the 1800s was that parks were really about public uh, 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 spaces and also health improvements. Uh, but that has grown throughout each era of parks. And the most recent park era was sustainable parks from generally the 1990s until through today. And some of the new aspects that park planning has taken on, some of the goals and functions include placemaking and ecological health, as well as resource conservation and community building. So more and more is being asked of our park spaces. And one of the questions we have is really, are we entering a new era of parks today? Certainly a lot has changed in the last few years and we very well could be entering that new era. On the next slide, one of the, the aspects of level of service that we wanted to highlight was that even though there is a lack of national standards here, we understand very well that communities are not always apples to apples, neither are parks. And so having a level of service standards for community and a measurement of how much parks and recreation is provided is really a way to help protect the community's access and the quality and the amount of parkland that is provided. Now, through our research, we've determined that no single measurement is really enough by itself. And in fact, there's about 10 common measurement tools out there today. And one of the most common ones that a lot of communities have adopted as a, as a standard is acres of level of service. And this is expressed through uh, the number of acres per thousand population. So let's talk a little bit about this basic uh, level of service measurement. This was really established in the 1930s through uh, research by George Butler and the National Recreation Association. And it started with the idea in, in uh, italics there, you can see with the idea of having 10 acres of park and open space per thousand population, plus an equal number of uh, area in parkways in large parks and forests. But a lot of communities over the last century have adopted that first portion, 10 acres of parkland. And that was really a standard up and through the 90s, which then was abandoned in terms of allowing communities to really define uh, the standards more to the locations and other factors specific to communities. And that's where the second poll came in. And that was one of the goals of the original definition of acres level service was to really have it vary according to local factors. Now, acres level of service, again, is one of the basic tools, but it doesn't address our conversations in terms of equitable distribution of parkland. And so when we're talking about equitable access, this, these are some of the items that we really take a comprehensive look at. And we may hear from some of you in terms of some of these items or points when it comes to access. It's not just about the physical development of our access network, whether it's roadways or transit or trail or sidewalks, but it's also some of the other aspects like facility and operations, such as are there restrooms? Is there parking? Is there access to transit? And also the hours of operations. These, these all become factors of, of access as well as user abilities, the age groups, disabilities or ability levels, heart health, obesity, as well as perceptions and demographic trends, whether there are uh, crime or loitering issues or lack of lighting or race or ethnical boundaries within communities, as well as language and communications. So there's a lot of aspects in terms of addressing equitable access. And that's one of the aspects of what we focused so far in our research. On the next slide, we have a couple more aspects of equitable access. The diagram on the top is what we call the urban transect. And from left to right, the transect runs from rural to urban conditions. We also wanna make sure that the degree of equitable access responds to how that is appropriate to that level of the urban transect. And lastly, on the bottom diagram, as Stephanie highlighted, 
was the advancements of some of our technology to be able to map out equitable access. So traditionally we've used the proximity tool and this is putting circles on maps, but we've gotten better and we've allowed and, and have used GIS to be able to actually identify true walk sheds and bike sheds from parks where actual access points and boundaries exist. And this has allowed us to get a much more accurate understanding of access within our communities. On the next slide, we want to highlight where we stand in terms of the progression of level of service tools within Fairfax County. And so the top two you'll see highlighted in blue. These are perhaps the most common that you see across the country. And these are actually historically used by the county in terms of planning and measuring parks and, and recreation facilities throughout the county. Now, in green, you'll see access distance or travel time. As we've talked about already, we've identified the need to look at access and that distance time. And that's something that is expanding across the country in terms of the progressive understanding of access and equitable distribution of parks. And it's been a target for the, the county to uh, adopt as well. Now, one of the areas that we're researching are the bottom three highlighted as emerging trends. And these are what are being explored by the county. And these add in the complete park experience, looking at quality of facilities, as well as capacity and the value of those experiences. Now combine all six can really lend towards a more comprehensive view of how parks and recreations are provided throughout the county. The last slide we wanted to highlight here is map of the United States. And some of the other communities that we've looked at in terms of trends and lessons learned. And what you'll see on this map are a mixture of different dots, green and yellow, green being communities that have recently adopted access or distance-based goals or standards within their level of service. And yellow represents communities that have uh, adopted even some of the emerging tools that we have, such as capacity or value or experience into those standards. So you can see across the country. A lot of work is being done and we can build upon that. Some of the lessons learned that we've identified is that communities are developing these measurements to be more in response to what is most important within the communities. And for a lot of communities that centers around equitable access, that's really been the largest growing trend in park planning. But also it doesn't necessarily address fully the equitable experience. And that's where the quality and capacity also plays into the measurement goals. Now, value-based or point-based level of service can also accommodate a combination of the acreage and quality and capacity and experience all together. That's where we stand today in terms of our hopes of adopting more comprehensive level of service measurement. Thank you, Nick. Great presentation. We appreciate it. And this is some of the basis that we'll be building on tonight. So now back to Stephanie for some polling. Once the poll is complete, there'll be an opportunity to discuss the results of the poll. And again, I will um, explain to you how you can join the conversation. I know we have a few folks already on the phone, so we know that it's working. So uh, Stephanie, let's begin the polling, please. Terrific. We're excited to kick off two questions to solicit some of your initial feedback in real time. My colleague Don will launch our first question. On your screen, you should see a, a box pop up and you'll see our first question, which states, in general, how often do you visit parks? With a few options, you might fall into a few categories here, depending on the season or time of year. But generally, we're asking everyone to think about throughout the year, how often do you generally visit parks? Um Oh, yeah. Sorry. Um, Stephanie, it looks like which of the following experiences are important to you is what's on my screen. Oh, sorry. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. I'm, I misspoke. Excuse me. Yeah. So thank you, Amy. So when you think about when you visit parks, which experiences are most important to you and you can select all that apply, whether that's active recreation, if you want to break a sweat, looking for exercise, contemplative experiences, you're looking to sit on a bench or relax the park or meditate. And then we're also looking at um, cultural historic recreation or enjoying the 
the natural environment and ecology or gathering and socializing. And so it looks like we're getting a lot of responses here. Thank you, every, thank you everyone. They can see it in real time on your screen. So we'll um, keep the poll open for just a, a few moments here. All right, looks like pretty much everyone has had a chance to provide their input. And again, this is a warm up poll question. We're going to get into a facility discussion in just a few minutes. We'll um, give the poll just another 10 seconds. Should we be seeing the poll on our screen at this moment? We're not seeing the real time responses, Dawn. Stephanie, we're not uh, we're not seeing them. Well, let's, we'll end the poll now and see. Is there, can you see the screen the the live results on your screen? Right now, yeah. they just came on yeah. right now. Thank you. Okay, yes. thank you. So it looks like the everyone who's 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 participating tonight and participating in the poll is looking for a variety of experiences. We have enjoy nature based, contemplative, passive experiences as the, as the top two. It looks like uh, also active recreation and social gathering is important. And then um, also as well, cultural and historic recreation. So this is really exciting to get your, your initial feedback on what type of experiences you're seeking. We um, are looking through the process strategy to provide a balance of those experiences at, at, at park sites. So with that, we'll launch the, the next poll question. I have a question, uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Sprague. Did, is this in regards to the poll? Because we will discuss. Yes. We will discuss. We'll discuss the results in just a moment. Are you having a okay. technical? Yeah, hold that. As long as you're not having a technical issue, just hang on to this. No, that's okay. Thank you. Right and on your screen, you should see our our next poll question come up, and that's how often uh, generally you visit parks. Are you a daily, uh, daily user. a daily user, a weekly user? Generally, do you visit uh, a couple, maybe a couple times a month or every few months, once in the last year, or maybe you you don't typically visit parks, you never visit parks, or you're not sure, prefer not to say. And you'll see that uh, inc be included live on the screen here. So. Um, We'll I'll keep the poll open for a, a few more seconds. We're getting some responses in. We have about, about 15 people responding and we'll keep it open for another maybe 10 to 15 seconds and then we'll share the results so everyone can see what type of park users we have in the room here. All right, we have a, a pretty good response here. So we're gonna go ahead and end the poll and, and share that with everyone on the screen and I'll read it out loud as well. So it looks like about a little over half of, of, the, of, of those of you who are joining us this evening are weekly park users. We have some really active daily users too. Um, we're really excited to have, um, to have everyone join us. And we have a couple monthly users, those who goes to parks once every few months and, and once in the last year. Thank you very much for joining us in the warm-up poll session. All right, well, that was very informative. Um, and now we want to hear from you. Uh, do you have any questions about PROSA? Uh, what do you do in the park system that makes parks more inviting or accessible? And how can we make parks work for you? We're going to let everybody see each other in screen so that we have a better uh, sense of uh, community discussion. And we're also going to allow people to uh, raise their hand or just uh, uh, let me know some way, shape, or form if you would like to, uh, to comment. Also, uh, one of the most effective ways is to comment into the chat box. So I don't know that we have any comments in the chat box. Um, let's see, I see a hand up here. It was Joe, but I think that there was a gentleman who spoke up during the, uh, during the poll who wanted to speak. Was it Dave? Yes, it was. Okay, please go ahead, sir. Um, 
I just wanted to say that, especially the first question and the second too, I guess, is can be very skewed depending upon the age group of the people answering. Um, because a younger person is always going to say they want the swimming, the golf, the tennis, all that kind of stuff. Um, and it's skewed by the park that they have access to. And I say that because I'm the park coordinator for our association, which covers our area for Azalea Park, which is like the furthest east park in Fairfax County. And it's about a block long, it's about the size of a block. And so you, we don't have any activities in it other than playground equipment for the kids. And so I go walk, people walk their dogs there every day. I walk mine like three times a day, but we don't have a way to do anything else there because of the limitations of the park. And I would tell you, I've lived in my house over 20 years here and I know, do not know where other parks are other than the golf course and the parks that have tennis courts. And I've never seen a publication that shows all the neighborhood parks that would be available for use. So anyway, that my two cents worth. Okay, well, we appreciate those two cents. And, you know, we take it all uh, down and we make notes. Um, so let me, uh, let me unpack a little bit of, um, of your comment. I'm very familiar with Azalea uh, Park. We were involved in the planning of that um, neighborhood and community, you know, different parks are really for different purposes. That is truly a walk to community park. There's no parking there, essentially. That is for, you know, folks who can walk there. And so- and we don't even have sidewalks in this area either. Right, right. But yeah. Uh, the community was very involved in the redo of the park, which was mm, less than 10 years ago, I can tell you that much. But um, yeah, it was probably it, six years. Yeah, I, but your points are are well taken. And I would invite if any of the um, any of the folks, you know, on the staff want to add to that. So we'll leave it there. I want to address something in the comment box, which was please repeat what input you're asking us for. So we're asking if you have any questions about PROSA, which is the presentation that we just um, just just heard about, and um, also, you know, in the park system, what can we do to make parks more inviting and more accessible, and what can we do to make parks work for you? Okay, so it's very broad, it's very general. That's the point. We want to hear all kinds of different ideas, thoughts, etc. So we have a hand up here, uh, Joe um, uh, Dombia. Uh, Joe, would you like to speak? I can. Yes. There we go. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate you making the presentation. I certainly welcome tremendously, you know, the um, initiative of going towards levels of service because this is an indication of more holistic approach and way to to handle things. So you know, I feel you know you know very good about that uh, philosophy that you are embracing. I have a couple of questions, if it's okay. When we talk about the quality of the facilities, which is consistency across geographies, how are you going to determine what is the consistency when we have different parks and we have different communities? And going on the different communities, then I wonder how much effort have you made to engage the multicultural communities, you know, communities in the low income pockets who don't even speak English. And the only option that they have for recreation would be going to the park. And they don't feel welcome today because of the whole, you know, language, uh, you know, the, the, so the culture and itself, or, you know, going to the park, feeling discomfort. And so how, are you integrating, you know, that uh, multicultural dimension linked to the consistency, the access of the geographies? Another question that I have, it is to ensure that everybody is going to have, you know, access to green, let's say in, in 10 minutes. Are there budget available? Are it going to be land, additional land that is going to be acquired to be able to satisfy that coverage. And that's one question. And my last point, it is about into the elements of um, all the elements of, um, 
enhancement and psychological relief and being embraced and bathed by the green, basically. Um, are the aspects related to tree planting and tree protection from invasives and whatnot in some parts? Are you, because that would be part of the making, you know, the space really beautiful and gorgeous to all. So thank you for the opportunity. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I think I got four questions out of that. Um, we're going to try and um, address a couple of them. So um, I can tell you that, um, you know, we are working in terms of language accessibility, doing things that we really haven't done before. Um, you'll find that this um, program that we're working in tonight has a capacity to, um, to translate sort of on the spot so that that is much more um, accessible to people than it was uh, previous to that. We're also working right now in Mount Vernon Woods. We held a hearing there um, just a couple of weeks ago. We had an interpreter there. And uh, for the first time in my career, I had to actually have somebody um, interpret the question that was handed to me on a card because it was in Spanish. So I considered that to be a wonderful thing that really the community was very involved and had the opportunity to, um, to participate. We talked also about green space. Uh, we have about 24,000 acres of parkland green space. It's probably not that we don't have enough green space, it's that we probably don't have walkability, which this program can work to. So that's, that's sort of my expertise in those areas, but I'm gonna let the others who are really the planners talk to some of the other issues who'd like to address uh, some of Joe's points. Hey, Judy, I don't, I would, uh, I'll talk a little bit more about acquisition. Uh, I mentioned earlier that the capital improvement plan, and so did uh, Stephanie, that um, our capital improvement plan is how we spend our, 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 our dollars, our bond, primarily our bond monies and grants and things like that. And this, this effort here, this, uh, this document will, uh, will pinpoint areas where we should make acquisitions where we're underserved for parkland. Um, and to your other point, as far as, uh, and, and to the gentleman before, um, you know, a small park is, doesn't, there's not a lot of different things we can do there. So we're looking for opportunities for parks that are a little bit larger where we can have more offerings, more a whole park experience, more things to do for folks. So this, this document, this effort will identify and inform our future acquisition strategies. Uh, for in order to bring parks closer to people and also to bring park experience different park experiences uh, closer to uh, the folks who would uh, avail themselves of them so it's it's a big part of our effort you also talked about the experience being the same at parks throughout the community and i can tell you that our executive director jay cole uh, talks about that point all the time that it shouldn't be any different for folks who live in the mount vernon district than it is for folks who live in the Springfield district. The recreational opportunities need to be countywide. And so again, the work of PROSA and um, just additionally, as we do needs assessments, as we go out into the community, you know, um, all the time, um, that's educating us so that we need to, we, we know we need to do a better job and to make it a more level uh, playing field, literally and figuratively, uh, than we have in the past. Any other team members that want to comment on 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 Joe's uh, questions and and observations? Okay, we'll leave it there. But do know that we're recording this, and this is we're taking down notes, and so your comments are very important, and, and we do appreciate it. Let me um, just go to the chat, and then I'll come back and take another uh, comment from folks in the hands. Um, first of all, I do want to tell you that we do have. Um, uh, on our website, there was a comment before about, you know, I don't even know where other parks are. Please go to our website. My goodness, we have a park locator. We have all kinds of systems and people that can help you to uh, to find things. You want to know where there's, um, dare I say it, pickleball courts, or you want to know where there's equestrian um, facilities, you can send a, something to park mail, park mail at fairfaxcounty.gov, and we can find that information for you. Or if you search in the box on the uh, on the website, uh, we can get you there as well. So um, Sam says, uh, secure bike racks are something that I think greatly improves park access and quality. 
Anybody want to comment on secure bike racks? Okay, uh, Amy. I can't hear you. You're muted. I'm sorry. I just wanted to to clarify secure bike racks. Um, are you talking about like bike storage units or um, I, I'm just need a little clarification on that. Sam, can you comment more on that? Sam, I see you, but I don't know. I think it's from Sam Harmick, maybe. Yeah, Sam. No. I think Sam's just going to leave it there for now. We'll have to make okay. we have been, um We have been putting in new bike racks in a number of parks with a grant. Uh, those, you can secure your bike there, but it'll be your lock. And they are secured to the ground. So they won't walk away, but um, but that's, if that's what you mean by secure, no, you'd have you'd have to lock them yourselves. But uh, they certainly are lockable. Okay, and um, and then Lisa has commented that crosswalks and sidewalk access would make access safer. For example, at uh, Turner Farm, there's walkability issues. Lisa, did you want to add anything to that comment? Hi. Can't hear you, I'm sorry. Still not hearing you. They say that technology is our friend, huh? How about if I come back to you, Lisa, I'm going to go ahead and let somebody else and then I'll come back and see if, if you've resolved your um, your issue there. OK, can you? There you are. Can you hear me now? There you are. We can hear okay. you. <laughs> there we go. Um, yeah. Hi. So I, we live um, in walking distance of Turner Farm, but um, I find it uh, nerve wracking to try to cross Springvale. And I'm sure other people feel similar. Um, I really don't feel comfortable. Um, walking and so my question is really like because I understand that VDOT owns some of the right-of-ways is there opportunity to work with VDOT or other or transportation organizations to implement some of these changes anybody on the team want to address sure sure. Please. sure this is Sam Hudson the park planning um, manager and I will say that our team is actually partnering very closely with FCDA on the active care fact active Fairfax uh, transportation plan. And so we are certainly trying to coalesce our PROSA analysis and recommendations around that. So I think that we are really working towards exactly what you're speaking to, Lisa. Yes, and in we fact, are. yeah, we have we, a project that uh, Brendan can talk to you a little bit. Yeah, Lisa, we, we do understand that specifically Turner Farm, that's a good example. It's in an area with uh, not a lot of housing, um, so it's uh, and also uh, very narrow roads. Uh, we are adding parking as we speak uh, to the park. Um, I don't know if it'll be open every day, but we will have parking so you can safely drive to the park and park and use the park from from uh, you know from within the park. So uh, they, there's it's not one size fits all on these things. We have a lot of parks that need sidewalks. We're working on that with the DOT and the comp plan for Fairfax as well. Uh, but uh, this is a big part of that process is identifying these those gaps, um, how we get people to parks. And that's a, a big part of this process. And that parking lot's really gonna help the equestrians also with their trailer parking. Um, so I think that's a, a much much needed and uh, very popular um, project, but your point is well taken. Um, let's see, uh, there's been a very patient hand over there. Susan, would you like to, uh, to join us please? Would you like to comment? I'm sorry, you're going to have to unmute. I'm sorry, we can't hear you yet. Okay, now I got it. Um, too many different kinds of equipment to learn. Everything is different, one after another. <laughs> so, um, 
I thought the poll was very interesting. I realize it's just a small sampling of us here on the meeting tonight. It might be very different if we had a wider poll of all the citizens in the county. But it, it seems almost that some of the things are uh, opposing each other. People who want nature and to meditate might find it difficult to do among all those who want active athletics going on. So it seems the uh, Park Service and all of us have a have some difficulties in, in trying to make everyone happy within the same distance that we've gotta be um, thinking about the quality of those opportunities, not just providing them. I mean, oh, here's a little patch of green space. You can't sit down and read your book if, you know, 500 yards away, there's a football game going on, for example. So I hope we think about the quality of what we'll, we'll be able to offer people as well as just, you know, having it. Thank you. I think that's a well, well-made point indeed. And I can, as you well know, yeah, we don't make everybody happy all the time. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's a given that, that we know for sure. But thank you. I appreciate it. So um, Shelley Deutsch uh, notes that sidewalks are so important to make parks safe and accessible. Uh, for example, Oakton Community Park on Hunter Mill Road. Okay. All right. Who else do we have? And, uh, and Joe adds, will there be follow-up reports to the public or public meetings on the development process of the plan? So that's jumping a little bit ahead because we're going to tell you what's happening next, but the answer is absolutely yes. Let's see, Lenny, I believe that you have your hand up. Yes, thank you. Uh, actually, that's my husband's email. Uh, I thought as much, but I'm, gonna <laughs> I'm not a Lenny. <laughs> but hey, um, so I was wondering, um, you know, it, it seems like there are a lot of questions about having better sidewalk access to parks. And um, in general, what I notice here is that you know, even in Prince, I can go to other places, Charlotte, North Carolina, my kids are in college, various cities, even in Woodbridge, um, Prince William County, Arlington, they have complete streets, they have bike trails along the roads. And I, what I notice here is I feel like um, in my area of Burke that there's a lot of trails that are for recreation just to go on a bike ride sightseeing, but there aren't trails linking my house or different things like a school to a library a school to a park. And I feel like those are really needed. And, and some areas I know may not be very conducive to that, but the city of Burke has, is known to be very um, low in walkability and bikeability. And so it makes it hard for kids, especially my kids love to go to the parks, but we're so fr <laughs> frightened for them to ride. There's one stretch, you know, from my house to get to Burke Lake Park, same going to Wakefield. Um, it's just very unsafe. And um, so, it, it just is, it's a lack of the infrastructure on the, on the streets, that there's not a complete street, there's not multi-use trails alongside the roads that I see in so many other places. And in Fairfax County, I do see like the long, again, the multi-use trails like along Fairfax County Parkway, but I, you know, I've, I might not, that's not a, I've, I've ridden on those and I enjoy them, but that doesn't take me, you know, within a 15, 20 minute bike ride to you know, something like a park or something in my community of service that I might really use and need that you know, where I would be more likely to use active transportation or you know, just leave my car at home altogether to use. And that, that's why I wanted to ask about is, do you have a plan to connect your parks to your schools, to communities and services, things like that? Would anybody on the team like to respond to that? Um, this is Sam Hudson, the planning manager, and I, I jump back in again just to um, share again about our involvement with Active Fairfax, uh, which is the uh, Fairfax County Department of Transportation study, as many of you may be aware, that is looking to do, I think, exactly what um, the suggestion is towards connecting between different community assets and community um, destinations. And so we have several of our staff who are actually on the Active Fairfax team. So we are regularly working with FCDOT and then we also will be working with them to hopefully um, help to elevate certain park connections. 
uh, as priorities for capital investments uh, outside of our parks. So hopefully uh, we will have more to share with you all on that as Active Fairfax continues and as PROSA proceeds as well. Thank you. Uh, Xander, I'm sorry, you know, your hand is on a part of your picture that's white. And so I couldn't see it, but the back behind the scenes guys have said, hey, why are you ignoring Xander? So please, uh, my apologies. What's on your mind? That's okay. I can see how that would happen. Um, I have uh, two questions mainly related to how PROSA will be used. Uh, you've said it tonight. And then I also heard in the Park Authority board meeting that PROSA would be a used to inform procurement and talking about how this will guide where new Fairfax parks are. But I also heard at that Park Authority board meeting a little bit of disagreement about that. It seems like there were some members who were like, yes, we need to prioritize equity and absolutely if this area needs a park, that's where we're gonna buy it. But then others were saying, well, procurement is tricky. We never have two um, possible purchases that we can, pay, can compare at the same time. So how would we even use this? Um, and so my first question is, can you all clarify how exactly, what, what is PROSA? Is it a baseline survey that will be used just to know about household walkability access and um, park quality? Or is it going to have some weight to inform what the county will do? And if not, who decides that? Is it the board? Is it the park authority board or the board of supervisors? And then secondly, also related to future procurement, um, can you talk a little bit about how you all are thinking about the possibility of displacement, um, especially with all the research we're seeing about green spaces, um, driving up housing costs and making it so that people can't live in the communities where they used to live. And so um, I'm just wondering how, how that's getting, how those types of concerns are getting rolled into the data we're collecting and the future decisions. Thanks. So first of all, I want to commend you for, for watching the board meeting. Um, and I know the discussion that you were referring to. Um, and I would say that that's a, a bit of a political discuss, uh, discussion that is uh, probably ongoing at this point. Um, the, the, the difficulty is that there's never enough money um, to purchase all the land. And we compete with others who are purchasing land. But um, perhaps uh, some of our pros of folks can address the first part of your of your observation. Um, and then I might um, put Amy on the spot as the deputy director to talk more towards the uh, political uh, decision making process. So either Stephanie or Sam, would you like to talk about, you know, what's going to come out of PROSA that's going to be useful in terms of guiding? You know, in this case, we're talking about land acquisition, but it could apply to other facilities as well. Um, real quick, just wanted to um, jump in before uh, Stephanie and Sam, because I've been here a little bit longer. Um, we did a needs assessment, you know, years ago. And it gave us a huge amount of information that we've been making decisions on for the last um, 10 years. And so I think that the change in our direction with PROSA is that the needs assessment originally gave us, okay, we're, we're, we have a deficit of 10 fields. Okay, find 10 fields or a deficit of 20 something, find those quarts or something like that. They never gave us an understanding, that information never gave us an understanding of where those amenities or those parts of the parks that, that make complete parks should go. And so I think that's what's gonna be one of the most important things that come out of PROSA. Um, the other political discussion, um, everyone is committed to equity. Um, and we have to work through the realities of a lot of constituents and um, greater elected officials and everybody working through all of what that means. And so I think that that's an ongoing discussion, um, but it will be very focused on equity because the dollars are limited or we find more dollars, um, which we can see what priorities come out of PROSA um, that will help in that discussion. 
Um, one of the other aspects that we have with this plan is that we really haven't taken a proactive um, approach to pointing out those pieces of property that might be essential to connecting other parks together or or making things work better. And so I think that's also going to be um, a great asset that comes out of this project. Thank you, Amy. Um, anybody from Prosa want to add to that? I think Amy pretty much addressed those questions. All right. Let me go to the chat here because there's been an awful lot of uh, um, an awful lot of uh, folks who have been um, adding to the chat. So um, again, we asked, there was a question about reports to the public. And um, yes, there will be a report to the public. There will be a lot more discussion. I want you to think of this as a beginning, certainly not an end. Um, these folks, uh, they hired them full time and uh, they, uh, they are going to be working on this for quite some time. So um, even though we may only have a few people here, the um, survey is out in the community. We're getting some really good response. And so it's much bigger than the folks who have taken the time tonight to do this. Uh, Sam, you also uh, took the time to talk about bike parking, uh, the types of URX instead of wheel benders. And I know that means something to people who park their bikes. So that's good. And um, then uh, Bethany said, you know, I agree with the ideas about walking and biking accessibility as part of the study, making sure that we are evaluating and enhancing access by foot and bike would be very helpful. Also making sure that we have sustained funding for maintenance of trails as well as building them. And that's that's something we hear about all the time. You know, we need to take, we need to find the dollars to take care of those assets that we have, trails being one of them. So we know that, and I can tell you that um, the leadership in the park authority is being more aggressive than ever in terms of explaining to the Board of Supervisors why Although we do an excellent job with every dollar that we have, more dollars would be really good and would really help us get to some of those uh, maintenance levels that, that people expect in this community. Um, for new participants, please post the website. Okay, that's for the Transportation Bike Walk Active Fairfax. And uh, let's see, Mark uh, writes, hello everyone and thank you for this. Accessibility can be improved with trail signs. Uh, we've been improving the trails in Justice Park, but don't have any trail signs. Do you all do trail signs? And if so, how can we get some? And uh, like in one case, we need a small sign that has arrows showing main trail to left and straight ahead uh, to private homes. Anybody want to comment on trail signs? Well, I can tell you it's only. Only. <laughs> Go ahead. We have a lot to do on trail signs. As Judy mentioned, our new executive director visited all of our parks. And one of the main topics um, was direction, you know, communication when you're out there, trailheads. So we, we have a lot of work to do, but we definitely understand the, the challenge and the issue going forward. And uh, Karen uh, writes, agree that safety for people not driving is very important. Cars are so dangerous to others trying to use roads and bridges uh, that don't have enough space for users other than cars. Can I see a hand up there? Just a minute. Ago. I think Martha wanted to say something. Martha, please. Martha, did you want to speak? No, you were just agreeing. Okay, we'll take that. Um, so the community survey, it was a question um, um, about the community survey. It's intended to poll the whole county. I think we made that point a couple of times. So feel free to share it with your friends, your family. Think of it this way. When everybody gathers for Thanksgiving, pull up that computer and say, before you get any of that pie, you have to take this survey. We would appreciate that. All right. I know that there's a couple of other questions that we wanted to get to this evening. Um, and these are all good, and I'm not going to end the conversation by any way, shape, or form. But Stephanie, did you want to pose some of those other questions as we proceed? Yes, absolutely. And some of the, um, actually, people have already commented on these ones, but I'd, I'd love to hear more, too. What are the challenges and barriers that prevent you from enjoying 
Fairfax County Parks and Recreation, whether that's on your way to the park, like we've heard from many of you already in terms of the, the safety network and public realm network of the sidewalks and crosswalks. Also too, is there anything that um, you find once you're in parks that you find to be a barrier to enjoying, enjoying parks? We heard from a resident area earlier about cultural sensitivity and uh, that's one of our, our main questions for, for you all this evening. All right, so uh, getting back to the uh, uh, to the chat, um, Mark uh, Donhart writes, um, on accessibility and interest, obviously if a playground is too small or only has a few pieces of age appropriate equipment, parents might not frequent that playground. Is there a studied relationship between local neighborhood population and demographics and the number and types of playground equipment to draw parents, kids, and to draw repeat visits? This may be actually Nick Kuhn, our resident expert joining us this evening, may have insights on playground studies um, that he might be able to share. Yeah, I, I, I can, yeah. can also help with that, Sam. Nick, why don't you go um, ahead and start yeah. and then we'll go to Brendan. Okay. Yeah, there's <clears throat> there's certainly a lot of aspects in terms of the, the types of playgrounds uh, and, and people having access. You know, we have, a, uh, playgrounds that serve um, typically certain age groups, whether two to five or five to 12. Um, and that's where I think the quality comes into the big factor here in terms of uh, whether the playground has, uh, say, a rubberized surface, uh, shade, um, whether it has multiple uh, play uh, elements within it. And also the type of, of play, is it um, a, a nature-based or adventure-based um, kind of setting? So there's lots of different um, elements that, that ultimately get factored into um, uh, playgrounds and, and their, um, their range the, and, and quality and capacity that they all offer. And, uh, and thanks for that question. That's, a, that's a, actually something we're really grappling with now. We're, our, we have a lot of parks, a lot of playgrounds, um, many of them built or put in initially you know, 20, 30 plus years ago. Uh, so they're a little bit on the smaller side. And as we replace them, we've been replacing them primarily for funding reasons and for site access issue reasons with the same size playground. So we're pulling that back now and we're looking at a case by case basis at our playgrounds as we go forward to see, do, do we need to go back um, and, and, and build, a be, build a bigger, build a better playground uh, better amenities at those playgrounds. Again, break out those age groups and, and see if we can accommodate more. So that's very active right now with us. Um, I hope you'll see um, a change over the next few years. Uh, again, we were just, we're trying to keep up with playgrounds that are aging out over time and there's so many of them, it's a chore, but we had been primarily putting them back the way they were. Not the same amenity, but the same size, the same scope. So uh, that is something that you'll see, uh, hopefully you'll see changing uh, starting now actually. Uh, so you'll, uh, in, uh, in the future, that's gonna require more funding. So that's something we're, we're dealing with uh, internally as well, but we, we are um, certainly agree with that and, uh, and are gonna do our best to, uh, to make some of those changes. Thank you, Brendan. Uh, here's a comment, FCPS needs to coordinate with active Fairfax connectivity, okay. And um, let's see, I'm a member of the board for the Fairfax Alliance for Better Biking. Join us, help advocate for safer, more accessible biking in Fairfax. I joined specifically because I want to help make it easier and safer for my kids to bike to school, practices, and stores. And if you look in the chat, uh, that individual has provided the link there. That's good. Uh, Karen, some schools have started safe routes to school programs uh, to address those barriers. Uh, to walking and biking to school. And there is information on both the FCPS and the VDOT sites, okay? Um, and Xander says, thanks all. Um, what about access within the parks? I live near Valley Crest Park in Annandale within walking distance, which is great. However, the path that moves through the park crosses Holmes Run. And there was a crossing with railing once upon a time. The railing was washed away a long time ago and has never been replaced despite neighborhood efforts to secure new railing, all of which means 
Persons that are not the best balanced can no longer enter the park at this point. In fact, folks have fallen off the concrete posts that function as a bridge. Uh, what about that kind of access? I think those are called fair weather crossings. Um, and they are throughout the park system. Um, can anybody speak to, you know, uh, this particular issue at this park or um, let's see, that's Holmes Run. I, I actually, um, I believe our um, trails team is, is understands that challenge at Holmes Run is and is working on um, quite a few um, aspects of that one at this point. I don't have an update at this moment, at this point yet. It's we are capturing all the yeah. comments though, and and um, that's all going to be uh, be in the findings. Um, are you involved with the seven corners redevelopment to try and get some small areas developed into green park area? Seven corners redevelopment is that on our plate? Uh, it certainly is not something that's being led by us. However, our park planning team is involved in review and contributes to conversations around new developments. So um, I don't have specifics at this moment, but I imagine that we have been involved to some extent in that. So we have a. I've represented our association at a couple of the meetings that they've had, and it's a joint effort between Falls Church City in Fairfax County on the redevelopment. And my point when I put that up there is, if you ever was gonna be involved in order to sway them to include some green slash park space, it'd be early. And that's where we are right now, they're early. And it's again, Falls Church, City and Arling and Fairfax County that's doing the efforts. Okay, so noted, thank you. Um, Another uh, comment about trail signs as well as multi-language signs needed as well. Um, a Justice Park supporter asked for some guidance on how to create compliant and effective trail signs. I think, uh, I think we did note that earlier. Uh, the goal is to increase park access, will hopefully necessitate dealing with the elephant in the room, which are social trails, especially in linear stream valley parks like Difficult Run where decades old social trails provide most of the existing east-west shared use access to difficult run in the CCT. Citizens realize one of the main issues with recognizing social trails surrounds funding or lack of funding for maintenance. And there are many volunteer groups that would like to see FCPA have the ability to work with uh, park patrons to formally recognize social trails, establishing processes to make it easier for FCP to work with volunteers to formalize long-term agreements, partnerships that could supply labor and funding to help with ongoing care, maintenance of our truly essential network of social trails. Uh, I believe our position at this point is that we don't recognize social trails, but of course we, we do know that they're there. Um, and in some, you know, really it's site specific. I know in this particular case, we're familiar with uh, some of the concerns of the neighbors um, and that ongoing uh, discussion, so to speak. All right. Um, thank you, Brendan and Nicholas on the playground answers. And uh, let's see, Susan says, um, lots of good ideas and plenty of wants. We cannot forget that we must also pay for all of our wants. And boy, if that isn't the one of the better comments of the night, um, clearly, you know, we, uh, we are funded and this wouldn't take in all the capital funding, but essentially, from the general fund about half a cent, 0.6 cents of each tax dollar. Um, so Parks um, parks does uh, manage, but struggles. And for us to do so many of the things that are required for us to get an equitable, more accessible park system, uh, we know that there need to be conversations um, with the Board of Supervisors to uh, continue uh, to see that support grow. And um, I will say this much, they, the conversations have started and they are certainly listening. So, uh, you know, we keep our fingers crossed that, um, that, that that continues and that we can use things such as PROSA to show the real need based on facts, data, opinions, that kind of thing. All right, let me see. Are there any other comments? I don't want you to go home tonight and say, 
I should have said something at that meeting, but I didn't. No? Okay. Stephanie, did you have anything that you'd like to share before, before we close out tonight's meeting? We appreciate everyone's comment engagement in the chat and also uh, verbally as we'll dive into it without the last moment to, to comment. Um, did want to uh, add one other question for everyone who's joined us tonight, and that is uh, what experiences would you like to see more of at Fairfax County Parks? While we're going for a balance of those different park experiences, that doesn't mean that all parks will have each of these features, that everyone will have access to these, to these features throughout the county. So Stephanie, would you give us an example of kind of what your, what, what would be an experience that you'd like to see at a park? Maybe that'll start the conversation. Yeah, certainly. So when you when you go to the park that, that you uh, primarily visit in your week to week or month to month, are you looking for um, an area to a paved area to walk? Are you looking for something that the more contemplative, passive experience, like a seated bench with shade? Are you also potentially looking for something that is more cultural and historic uh, recreation? And Going back to our poll question that we looked at earlier, those kind of four major buckets that we're, that we're, we're thinking about are active recreation against breaking a sweat, contemplative passive experiences to relax and meditate or you know have some quiet downtime. Also social recreation, so utilizing picnic facilities and meeting up with friends, family, or neighbors, and also natural and cultural experiences. So who'd like to just give us some ideas before we close out our conversation tonight? If you go to the park, what do you want to do? Okay, uh, Sabrina, what would you like to do when you go to the park? Mm. <laughs> I think, <coughs> I'm sorry. That's all right. I think nowadays, uh, not like a uh, previous, so we would, would like to see more activities in the park. Um, special um you know you you will feel safe in the park um and uh i think the fairfax the city uh the park uh we can see more and more activities in the uh during the weekends and uh, um you know in the past i think the when the park is quiet um special for the national park if it's quiet we can have our uh, you know enjoyment for the natures but for the city inside of the city the more activity uh, people may think is safe um and uh, i uh, i don't know is there any uh you know um like planting um the the uh, class or volunteer could be doing landscapes or um, the organization could to be you know join with the park authority together to have those uh, um, activities thank you for that input uh, the great news is there's lots of opportunities to plant things pull weeds volunteer in a million different ways um, gardening there are garden plots we don't have enough we have a huge waiting list no matter how many garden plots we seem to put in, but uh, those are all great ideas and um, and we appreciate the input. Let me go to the chat real quick and then I'm gonna come back and catch Joe, okay? Thank so, you. Um, let's, whoop, it just moved on me. Hold on a second, let me move back. Um, so I'd love to see more social options such as grills and bonfires. Hmm, okay. Not sure about the bonfires. We might get a little pushback from our maintenance folks. Um, Kate, to everybody, uh, thank you all for this information. As president of Clifton Horse Society, we are looking forward to working further with the county on continuing trail and equestrian facility maintenance. Thank you. We appreciate that. Um, looking for natural trails without significant improvements, idealized for safe, calming, rejuvenating experience with nature. Um, I'm, a ha I'm an active user. But I'm always happy to see so many family and friends gathering in places like Burke Lake Park and Occoquan Park, which is uh, Nova Park, but um, also Burke, uh, especially during the pandemic, parks were an oasis and a place to safely gather. And I hope that continues uh, 
that we can promote that. And I would just tell you, we did cell phone um, surveys during the pandemic and the numbers were incredible that people came out to the parks. You're exactly right. People felt safe in the open space and those tremendous crowds um, in many ways have still continued to this day. So if ever we doubted that parks were an important part of the community, uh, we certainly got an answer at that point that that was, uh, that that was true. Joe, your turn now, please. Thank you. You know, I was thinking, you know, uh, I don't have small kids, but, you know, small kids would look for uh, areas with playgrounds, yes? You know, kids with adolescents would like to have sport areas. For me, I would like to see that the trays are clean, that they don't have invasives, that they don't have, um, that they don't have, you know, overgrown, overgrown areas. Um, I like to see gardens, you know, because they make it look so pretty. Um, and um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Beverly, your hand is up. Uh, yes, one of the things I thought that might, I don't know if it's possible to get a more variety of input, but doing something like taking a road show out to some of the senior citizens uh, 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 places, uh, perhaps some churches and perhaps some schools, that would might give you a even wider perspective of people and help promote uh, the addressing the, of equity. And I, I second Kate's comments on thanking you for all the equestrian support. We appreciate that. Thank you. I can tell you, I've been to a lot of Rotary Clubs and a lot of civic organizations and to some uh, um, places, uh, you know, communities with um, with those who are over 60. Okay. And um, you're right. That's a great uh, great group of people who have specific ideas about how they want to recreate. So I think that's a point well made. Dave, what's on your mind? I just want to touch on something that Sabrina brought up and, you know, about having different events in the park. I guess we never have Fairfax County put on any events, uh, but the association, like I had park cleanup two weeks ago and had 30 some people there to clean everything up. Um, uh, during the summer, we had um, a showing a film in the park for the kids. Uh, we had Halloween party for the kids uh, last weekend, a Halloween parade for the kids, but that's all put on by our association and not put on by Fairfax County. And my, I guess my question has always been because of other places I've lived, are, should we be asking the county to put them on instead of us doing it? Or, I mean, uh, we don't even tell the, ask the county's permission. We just do it because nobody from the county comes except to mow, well, a contractor, and to put out some of that rubberized mulch and that's and pick up trash on Sundays. And that's the only time we see the county. So I guess my question is, should we be as active as we are as an association um, and leave some of it uh, up to the county? So I guess I can say that, you know, with 420 parks, um, we couldn't possibly do events in every single park, but we do countless events, many of which are, are at um, some of the larger staff parks. Um, not a weekend goes by that there aren't some very, very significant events. So, um, <coughs> excuse me, I would say, um, you know, if, you, if you're looking for some assistance from us, you know, reach out and I'm sure that there would be um, a willingness to, uh, to at least consider those. But I know that at that park, the community is very active as many other HOA or community groups. Um, they take that on as something that they want in their community. Yeah, we, uh, we even plant our own azalea plants that we acquire, uh, get donated from the different nurseries in the area and we plant the azaleas in the park. So I, I just was curious and, and I do report the volunteer hours back to the Fairfax County Park Volunteer Coordinator. Oh. Um, Great, Julie, yeah. Yes, yes. I sent her the report on the, our park cleanup when we had all the people there. Um, and so, okay, I just wanna make sure we weren't doing something no. incorrect. <laughs> no, no, Dave, no. Actually, if you have um, like newsletters about all of your activities, send them to us. We would love to hear about it. That's great work that you all are doing. 
Okay, thank you. I can tell you, I just saw the stats on volunteer service uh, for this year, and it was um, over 3,000 volunteers. And of course, it doesn't uh, count the folks, Dave, like the folks in your neighborhood who plant azaleas, and uh, well over 100,000 hours of uh, volunteer community service. So um, there's an awful lot of that going on. Let me return to the chat real quick. Thank you for providing this welcoming and inclusive experience tonight. I'll, uh, I'll let uh, Stephanie enjoy that along with Sam. Um, it was great to have the parks and we appreciate all you do. Thank you, Bethany. Um, Charlie writes, uh, would be timely with active Fairfax to plan trail connection um, across Bull Run at Poplar uh, Ford Park to Manassas Battlefield and better bike head link to uh, Colchester Park and preserve opposite Belmont Bay in Prince William County. Okay. Also park personnel who speak languages other than English. Um, that's a great point. And I can tell you that we are working hard to recruit diverse um, um, employees at all levels um, and very actively working that. Joe, I think that's a, a point well taken. Um, learn more about how FCPA is fighting invasives. The invasive management uh, plan is, uh, you can look at that and find out how to do that. Why not Booth? It sounds like you are excellent stewards and the county is contributing. Not sure I have all the context there. Um, uh, so uh, Bethany, if you, wanna, if you wanna clarify that. And Richard, I feel guilty driving to recreation, whether it's in a gym or a park. I'm very aware of the impacts of climate change and driving on our health and air quality. Being able to walk or bike to a park versus driving my car is very important to me. Plus greater walk bike ability helps local businesses and home values. Thank you for highlighting how parks saved everyone during COVID lockdowns. You and our parks were all great and I thank you. Uh, let's see, I'm just gonna catch up with a couple more. Uh, great to plant just native plants in the public parks. Very strong point indeed. Thank you for all your work and we'll be supporting your initiatives. And um, Bethany clarified that was for Dave talking about his community organization helping with his local park. All right. I think that might be a good place to uh, to wind it up. Um, I'm sure that others uh, have things to do this evening, but this is again a starting point, a great uh, a great bit of work. And thank you so much for uh, you know for giving us your time tonight. Um, the survey is on the project page. It's going to continue to be open through the middle of December. You can sign up for updates on Prosa. And uh, if you have any questions, please, yeah, here we are. Please uh, reach out to the link at prosa at publicinput.com. Let me just close with one of my uh, favorite, favorite sayings by activist Margaret Mead. And uh, she noted, you know, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. Your input is invaluable, and we appreciate your participation. Thank you. Be well. And good night.